Now, as we begin, I'd like us to do a quick little exercise together. So if you have access to our hymn book in the chair in front of you, grab one. Or if you're slightly more daring and have a cell phone, you can do this as well. So I would like you to turn to two hymns. Turn to the first and keep your place in it, if you would, uh, to the hymn Rejoice the Lord is King. This would be hymn number 197. Rejoice, the Lord is King. After doing that, and keeping your place there before I ask you what I'm about to ask you, then turn to hymn 8. So hymn 147, and then hymn 8. Eight one ninety seven. Excuse me, I led you astray already. Now, here's the exercise. I'd like you to compare this first hymn from Charles Wesley, who wrote several hundred, in comparison to Martin Luther, who also wrote several hundred hymns. And I would like you to concentrate in the Wesley hymn on stanza three. And I want you to compare it to the last stanza, particularly the last line of Luther's hymn. Now, a prize for the person who can tell me how the two are related. What do you see of the connection of these two hymns? Now, you can be wrong if you say, so just, I, that's what I tell my students. They're, not everyone's answer is right, so this may, uh, what do you see? There we go. So your reward will be not on earth, but in heaven. <laughs> no, actually, I have Jolly Ranchers I give the kids, so you get a Jolly Rancher. You got it, and you all can see this. This is not rocket science. Rejoice, the Lord is king. His kingdom cannot fail. He rules o'er earth and heaven. The keys of death and hell are to our Jesus given. And then the final line of Luther's, a mighty fortress is our God. His kingdom is forever. So these two men living centuries separating them, say virtually the same assurance for the believer. So today, they are our teachers. Now, whether you prefer the lofty Wesley hymn or the weighty Luther hymn, the truth is the same. Nobody, nowhere, can do nothing, excuse the grammatical faux pas there, to destroy or dismay or deter our God's kingdom from advancing. As we read the story of 2 Samuel chapter 17, if you were a fly on one of the palm trees in the backwoods of David, you may put a big if to that. Well, okay, his kingdom is forever if. I'm not sure this is going to turn out like it is. Because of the Absaloms and the Ahithophels of David's life who seek to overturn God's desire for David and advance a kingdom all to themselves. Fast forward to 2021. We also have Absaloms and Ahithophels running around the place. And we too can give pause to the fact that God's kingdom is forever. We might think... uh, Have you looked at this world recently, Brian? The Ahithophels and the Absaloms that are advancing their own kingdom at the detriment of gods in the form of politics and power, egos and evils, sin and sufferings. And we might think, is his kingdom forever? This is why if we're looking at 2 Samuel 17 and in our own lives, it is always wise, beloved, that if we have one eye on the world, 
and what's going on in our lives that we should have one eye in the scriptures. And when we look to 2 Samuel 17, we should be at the same time looking at 1 Samuel 28 and 2 Samuel chapter 3 and 2 Samuel chapter 5 and 2 Samuel chapter 7. In all of those chapters, God comes to David and says, David, your house will be forever. So if Ahithophel and Absalom succeed, not only does David's kingdoms vanquish, but our God's word cannot be trusted because he says, my kingdom is forever. Brothers and sisters, if there's any encouragement today, take from your teachers, Wesley and Luther, They are right when they tell you his kingdom is forever. So with that in mind, we now come to 2 Samuel chapter 17. Now we have been here, we kind of know the background. David is in the midst of a revolution by his spoiled brat son, who for the last four or five years has been building an army north. That is a formidable army. David is completely caught off guard completely disorganized, and so he has to leave Jerusalem, the city that he took for the first time in Israelite history. He has to vanquish his throne, and like he was for 10 years with Saul on the run in the back country, learning how to be a guerrilla warfare again. He must get distance between Absalom and him. He does not have the numbers yet. And so he dispatches in an act of espionage his little saboteur named Hushia. And we learn here in this chapter, from a human perspective, this is one of the great oratory showdowns you have in Scripture. Now, pastors are quirky creatures. We just are. You know, we're, we're, we're weird. You just, you have to live a lifestyle of a pastorate. To, to be one because we're odd critters. And one of our oddities, at least mine, is I am fascinated with oratory. I mean, I cut my teeth on it. You pay me to speak, to talk. But I listen to Supreme Court justices' hearings. That's how bad I am, okay? And I parse what they're doing. In 2 Samuel 17, we have one of the greatest persuasive speakers in both Ahithophel and Hushia now going up against one another in one of these great showdowns that will determine if God's kingdom is forever. Now, we know a little bit about Ahithophel. Okay, we've, read, we've introduced him several times already. He happens to be the grandfather of Bathsheba, David's wife. But we're told, if there's anything we could say about him in the last verse of the previous chapter, his advice, when he gave you advice, is like getting the advice of Gabriel the archangel. Uh, The historian says that his advice is like getting an oracle directly from God. He has the King Midas touch when it comes to counsel. If you want to get rich, all you have to do is go to Hithophel and find out how to do it, and you're going to get rich. If you want power, prestige, status, he has the way to do it. And he serves as advisor to two royalties, King David and Absalom. And in fact, when he defects and leaves David's services to go to Absalom, David at that point thinks all is lost. Because Ahithophel is the Jedi master of counseling. He's never been wrong. And now he goes over to Absalom, which, ironically, is his only mistake up till now. He has been batting a thousand, but he, like so many surrogates, leave David and go worship the rising sun. Absalom's going to be the next king, so he shifts loyalties. And David thinks all is lost. And in an act of total desperation, he sends in Hushia to try to rival, more appropriately disrupt Ahithophel on some pure chance in God's workings that Hushia would sort of gum up the process, giving David some time to retreat. That is what is at stake. So Ahithophel 
has the first go at it. The first four verses is Ahithophel's advice. Now, as we look at these two characters and their great showdown, there's something going on that will be the climax of our story. I'll give you a hint and cheat ahead. It's found in verse 14, where we're introduced there to the wonderful counselor, the mighty king who frustrates all the plans of men and gives the ultimate counsel. We'll get to him in a moment. But in the first four verses, here is Ahithophel. If I could describe Ahithophel's advice to Absalom, it would be in the old mantra, strike while the iron is hot. That is his advice. Speed and stealth. Uh, His plan is a three-pronged strategy of how to take out David. And if we look at it from a military prowess standpoint, it really is spectacular. Uh, Ahithophel believes that in this battle's success is hit the gas pedal and don't let up. In many respects, great military commanders who follow him take his advice. Napoleon, for example, who holds the record for the most amount of victories on the field of battle with 37, believed in a gas pedal offensive. Never let off your enemy. And to a lesser degree, in our American history, Thomas Stonewall Jackson adopted Napoleon's strategy. Stonewall Jackson believed, hey, if my enemy's retreating, there's a reason they're retreating. Go after them. And after the first battle of Bull Run, when Stonewall got his monkeyer, he actually wanted to keep marching to D.C. and kidnap Lincoln and end the war before it got started, but he was usurped by his superiors as a foolhardy plan. Ahithophel has a similar strategy. In fact, believe it or not, there have been doctoral dissertations written about the military plan of Ahithophel and how masterful it was. It's a three-pronged strategy. First, there is a laser light focus of attack. Go after David. It's not scattershot. Number two, hit them swift and by surprise so that they cannot coordinate their troops. And finally, a clear battle objective. Kill David. That's what Ahithophel's plan was. Go after him, put all the forces on David, kill him, And then Ahithophel, masterfully, gives reasons and results of adopting this strategy. He is a true communicator. Not only does he give the what, he gives the why. Here's what we're going to do, and here's the results of us doing it. So here's what Ahithophel tells Absalom. I will lead the troops into battle, and I will go after David only. I'll use all my concentration on David, and when I find him, I kill him immediately. And for the first time in his career, all of his troops will see a defeated leader. And they're not going to fight for a dead leader. They're going to be like, as he says here, runaway brides who have come to their senses. And no, they should go back to their groom and all will be forgiven because they made some hasty decision. Once they see David dying, they'll lay down their arms, they'll pledge loyalty to Absalom, they'll come back to Jerusalem and there will be peace and tranquility in the kingdom and very few men will die. We just go after David. When Ahithophel gives this strike while the iron is hot counsel. We can see in the text Absalom's advisors, his entire war council, and Absalom himself unanimously adopt the plan. This is very important for what comes later. They all agree, this is it. Great plan, you've done it again, let's do it. Now, beloved, forgive me for going historical on you. I am a history prof and teacher, but... There's so much of God's activity in history that we can trace. Maybe we don't see it at the time, but there are moments in history, very small, at the time, inconsequential, mundane moments, that because they happened, actually we look back and see that's when the war was won or lost. That was very significant. 
for example, it was pretty insignificant on one evening when General William Gage allowed George Washington and his troops to sleep on Brooklyn Heights. Gage had done his snake maneuver to restrict Washington's Continental Army in this one little island at Brooklyn Heights, and Gage had been slaughtering them all day. The sun sets, and Gage surmised, I won't go in for the kill tonight. Rather, I'll wait for the morning. I'll situate my cannon fire. And besides, if Washington has all night to think about what's coming, he'll surrender. Gage wakes up the next night or the next morning, and miraculously, Brooklyn Brooklyn Heights is empty. All night, Washington and his troops paddled across the river and got away to fight another day and fight another day and fight another day. And if that hadn't happened, if Gage went uh, after Washington that evening, we all might be sipping tea and singing God Save the Queen, right? In May and June of 1940, General Gettering led the Nazi uh, Blitzkrieg, his panzer units, in a surprising attack through northern France. One million French and British officers were on the border of Belgium looking eye to eye. They had not the slightest inclination that General Gadaring would go around them and box them in. And they boxed them in to a little place called Dunkirk. And the only way to get out was through the sea. Gadaring was two miles away from Dunkirk and wanted to smash the main army of the Allied troops ending the war before it got started, but he was interrupted from a call from Berlin, from Adolf Hitler, who told him to cease and to desist and retreat because Hitler wanted his big buddy uh, Goering, the head of the Luftwaffe, to come in and bomb him. And of course, we know what happened at Dunkirk. There is a verse 5 in this story that should never have happened. The story should have made a clean break at verse 4 after Absalom said, We love the plan. My counselors love the plan. We unanimously agree. Let's do it. But then we have this small, insignificant moment, verse 5 and verse 6, that turn redemptive history on its head. Had Absalom shut his trap piped down and did the plan, he would have been on the throne, David would have been deposed, and redemptive history would have looked a lot different. But Absalom, for all of his planning and patience, for all of his wit and persuasion, he is incredibly stupid. What does he do? Two big gaffes in verse 5 and 6. Number one... He asks Hushaya for advice. Well, that's like saying sick him to a dog. That's exactly what Hushaya is there to do. So he has just now opened the door for David's saboteur to walk in. But his second act of stupidity is he tells Hushaya Ahithophel's plan. He tells him the plan and says, what do you think? Which gives Hushaya the information he needs to not only go back to David, But to be an effective communicator, pick your opponent's argument apart. And he does. Now, for Ahithophel's advice of strike while the iron is hot, Hushaya's advice would be, look before you leap. It's the exact opposite. Hushaya knows David. He knows If Ahithophel's advice is taken, David is doomed. His army is not ready. They are complete chaos. They need time. And Hushai has got to give him time. Like Absalom duped the men of Israel to become king, Hushai has got to dupe Absalom with his advice. He begins with a pretty clever tactic. First, he discredits Ahithophel, but notice how he does. He doesn't say that Ahithophel is a fool. No, 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 you can't, this is the Jedi master we're talking about. 
So he goes in very subtly and says, you know, Absalom, Ahithophel, I mean, he's mighty Casey at bat. He knocks it out every time. But this, only this moment, this is the only time I would say this about him. I, I, I really think he's got it wrong. You can see how slick he is at playing this. He can't come out and say he's an oaf. He's got to sort of flatter him and say what a successful record he is. And he uses a three-pronged strategy to pick apart Ahithophel's three-pronged strategy. First, who... <laughs> Hushia discredits Ahithophel's counsel by appealing to logic and experience. Notice what he says to Absalom. You know your dad. This idea of Ahithophel's strategy that an army's going to go into his camp, kill him, and his officers are just going to lay down their swords and be at peace, they're a bunch of fighters. In fact, The primary word in your text that is most often used for David is fighter. He's a fighter. Absalom, this, your daddy, is the guy when no one else went out for a fight. He fought Goliath by himself. This is your daddy, the guy who fought King Saul, who had a national standing army for 10 years. He fought Saul to retreat. He didn't lay down. Your daddy is a guy that every battle he steps on, he wins because he fights. This idea that he's somehow going to lay down his arms, have his life be taken, and his troops are going to lay down their arms is a pipe dream. They are fighters. That's what they do. And the image is shifted. Ahithophel's image is they're like a runaway bride who when they come to their senses will come back to kumbaya with their groom. No, 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 no. Hushai says, here's the image. They're like a mama bear whose cubs have been taken from them. They are angry. They're chomping at nails. If any one of your soldiers get in front of them, they're going to tear them apart. you got to calm down. Let them calm down. Give them time to calm down, and then we'll hit them when they least expect it. But if you attack them now, you got to fight on your hands by men who know how to bleed. So he's an expert at doing this. Absalom, you know your daddy. He loves the odds. He's probably hid out in some pit in some cave now. He knows how to dwell in caves. He's done that before. He knows guerrilla-style warfare, and he's probably setting a trap right now For you to come in, and he hits you with guerrilla-style warfare. That's what he does. So the first prolonged plan of attack from Hushaya is discrediting Ahithophel's counsel by appealing to logic and experience. Look at your daddy's resume. He's a fighter. Number two, he undermines Absalom's confidence by appealing to fear. Now, fear, I believe, you know... Fears are often liars. People get scared of things they have no business getting. But fear can be a powerful motivational tactic. And Hushaya uses it well. Absalom, you kill people at a dinner table, your brother. Your daddy kills them on the battlefield. Once a year, Absalom, you cut your glorious Kelgon take-me-away hair and you present it publicly and weigh it, and you're so proud of it, let me tell you what your daddy does. He lifts up blood-infested hair of decapitated giants' heads and lifts it up. That's what he's known to do. And so you see Hushaya playing the fear-mongering strategy, and this comes with this great speech in verses 9 and 10. Look, here's what's going to happen. Your young buckaroos who do not have experience in warfare are going to go charging in to this wild bear, And they're going to hit men skilled in warfare who like to kill. And they're mad as hornets. And they're going to fight back. And the first time they hit your front line, your little punk boys who aren't used to fighting are going to retreat. And they're going to come at you and decimate your army. So you need to cool your jets. Look before you leap. Finally. And this is the linchpin. Hushaya buys David time by appealing to Absalom's vanity. Every man's weakness. 
We like our ego stroked. This is not only what Hushaya does well, but what Ahithophel doesn't do. So if you take the two speeches and you contrast them of what is lacking in Ahithophel's speech or what is present in his speech versus Hushai, what do you see? It's quite a contrast, isn't it? Here's Ahithophel's plan in a nutshell. I'll lead the battle. You give me 20,000 men, Absalom, you just stay put. I'll lead the battle. What kind of counselor does that? I'm going to take the glory of this field. I know David. I'm going to lead in battle. I'm going to kill David. I'm going to bring the soldiers back to Jerusalem to be at peace with you. I'm going to want, be the one that historians, when they write, will say it was Ahithophel that took the glory from the field. What does Hushiah do? Absalom, let's wait. And then you give the charge. You charge in. And don't spare anyone. Let the whole world know if you think David was great and tough. You ain't seen nothing yet because I'm taking no prisoners. Absalom, you wipe everyone out. You come back to Jerusalem and march in your victory parades. You take the throne on your own. So notice what he's doing. He's massaging that ego. And egomaniacs love when their ego is massaged. That gets Absalom. That seems to do it. It works like magic. Absalom and company, verse 14, now completely reverse their battle strategy. The counsel of Hushaya, they say, is better than that of Ahithophel. Ahithophel's plan was shredded into bits, and the hook was firmly set in Absalom's mouth. Hushai has got him. Verses 15 through 22 have a really fast-paced pins and needles look where Hushai dispatches information to the priests who dispatch information to the messengers. And what is amazing here is we know the outcome of the story. Yahweh knows the outcome of the story, but Hushai doesn't. He's actually dismissed before they confer their decision. So all who Shia has is what his plan was and what Ahithophel's plan was. And he relays that to spies who go tell it to David. They are then dogged by some of Absalom's confederates and they wind up in a farmhouse where a woman puts them in an abandoned well and puts grain over it, very reminiscent of Rahab and the two spies. They are protected And they are sent to David, and they dispatch the information. Here is Ahithophel's plan. Here's Hushai's plan. Again, David doesn't know which is going to happen, but he has time to prepare for both. And this is how the tension rises. Our final scene is in just one verse, verse 23, where we now read of the obituary of Ahithophel. Verse 23, when Ahithophel saw that his advice had not been followed, he saddled his donkey and set out for his house in his hometown. He put his house in order and then hanged himself. And so he died and was buried in his father's tomb. He dies like he lived, calculated and deliberate. But he kills himself in the end, this very wise man. Uh, one of, in terms of communication, I hang out with several communicators. Uh, once a month, I read the entire, or I've read the entire collection of Winston Churchill's speeches, for example. I love Churchill. I love Ronald Reagan and his communication. I love Antonin Scalia. But here's another off the wall one that I love equally is Robin Williams. I love Robin Williams, not because I don't pretend that he's regenerate. He was not. Uh, Some of his stand-up was vile. But he is a complete genius when it comes to improvisation. There will never be another in my life. He, He is a gift of God to communicate this way. And I'm reading a biography of Robin Williams now, And it takes on the whole story of how he fought depression his whole life. It led him to alcohol abuse, drug abuse, and of course, if you know his story, he kills himself. 
reading this book and I'm thinking, how can such a gifted man that literally makes me cry, I laugh so hard at his stand-up routines, in his own soul be crying and in sorrow. He's making other people laugh, but he's in living hell. Here's Ahithophel, arguably the wisest counselor, or one of them, humanly, takes his own life. The only motive we have that may let us in on his character is found in this verse. Why did Ahithophel kill himself? We're told only that he saw that his advice had not been followed. This might imply what his ambitions were once Absalom got to the throne. That is to say, he thought he would rule. This little pipsqueak spoiled brat, if he thinks he's going to rule the kingdom, he's got to think, I'm going to rule. And because that didn't see the light of day, he saw the handwriting on the wall. He knew that Absalom's little munchkins were no match for David's troops when they were assembled. And so he puts his house in order, shows that he's a wise man by doing it, and then goes out and hangs himself, showing that he's a complete fool. This is a strange mixture of natural man, isn't it? Of both discretion and desperation, of having a great mind and being totally mad in that mind. Will a man have enough wisdom to arrange his worldly affairs with such meticulous care and be so hapless as to end his life after? It's a strange inconsistency that he makes his will, and then because he cannot have his will, he wills to die. It's another proof of the insanity of men's souls. Thousands of people that you and I know without Jesus are setting their houses in order but destroying their own souls. They look at great care with their 401k, with their mutual fund, with their bank account, with their stuff. They have the best stuff, the best fashion, the best houses, the best toys, but they don't care about their heart and soul's interest. Professing to be wise, they're utterly and complete fools. They exercise forethought, prudence, and care everywhere but the one thing that it's most required. They save their money, they squander their happiness. They're guardians of their estates, but they're suicides of their souls. While Ahithophel's death is tragic, it is a reminder that God's people should take comfort in the sovereignty of God. Now, for the duration of the story, is our main character who only really devotes one verse to his action. Ahithophel is not merely a political rival of David. He is a declared enemy of God who chose David to be king. And he is a reminder that no matter how how hard you can huff and puff, you can never overcome God's kingdom. His kingdom will smash yours. And in our story, he uses a saboteur spy to do it, and he uses a woman who disguises a well to do it. I remember reading during the Scottish Covenanters where they were ejected in the Church of Scotland. They became Presbyterians, Protestants, and one particular minister on the run for preaching the gospel in the public square, King Charles's uh, troops went after him with with horses and swords, and he ran for miles and found shelter in a farmhouse, or actually in a barn in a farm. And he goes up to the hayloft in the barn, and he can hear the horses creeping up to the farm, and he knows he only has a few minutes to do something. So in a quick prayer to God, he then conceals himself under a mound of hay that has been freshly uh, harvested there in that hayloft. And he gets under it and prays. He can hear the footsteps of the soldiers and hear their, take out their swords from their sheaths and begin to, with their swords, pluck the hay. In fact, he later recounts that he could feel the cold steel of the sword go between his toes and had a scar for life because it nicked him. But after a few moments, they left and surmised that he could not be under the hay. Why on earth they would come to that conclusion, he didn't know until he got up out of the hay and found 
that in the duration between him getting in and the soldiers marching up the hayloft, a hen had hatched an egg on top of the place that he was sleeping. They surmised that that was her roost, and therefore no one could disturb it under. And this pastor remarks that it was God's hen that saved my life. In 2 Samuel 17, it is God's spy and a woman with an unmarked well that saves David's kingdom, humanly speaking. But we go beyond human. This is not the result, ultimately, of Hushai's finesse or of an unnamed woman's pluck. We have the main character, don't we? Verse 14, Now Yahweh had ordained to nullify the good counsel of Ahithophel in order that Yahweh might bring disaster on Absalom. This is no accident. This is no freak chance of luck. This is not the ultimate result of a guy's wit and a woman's pluck. This is a deliberate design plan from Yahweh who is telling Absalom, you think you little pipsqueak spoiled brat are going to in any way deviate my kingdom? You've got another thing coming. I will bring you down. And he nullifies the good counsel of Ahithophel to do it. It is as if he's shouting, here I am. I'm God. Hit me with your best shot. You cannot do it. Now, what this story teaches us as we close and take from it what we can, it teaches us that in 2021, God's kingdom is alive and well and marching on and will be triumphant, though militant. It teaches us that we might not see that victory. Like Hushiah had limited knowledge and David still on the run. But it teaches us that God's sovereignty is both invisible and quite visible every day of our life. What I mean by that is God (laughs) might not come to us Tuesday of next at 11 o'clock and said, Hi, I'm God. Uh, Here's my agenda throughout this day just to let you know. I mean, he can. He's been known to do that a time or two. But it probably means that when you're in the checkout line at Walmart scanning your celery, God is there. And when you're changing your kids' diapers, God is there. And when you're going to your kids' sports and school functions, God is there. And when you're dealing with cancer at the doctor, the wonderful counselor sits with you and says, My kingdom is forever. My kingdom is forever. We, of course, see this demonstrated powerfully in the gospel of the Son of David, Jesus Christ. Peter, a pretty good speaker at Pentecost, brought these two realities together and said to the Jewish audience, you delivered Jesus to die. You killed him. You are responsible At the cross, Jesus did not die. He was killed by murderous, deceiving, evil men. You, that's what Peter is saying. But he quickly pivots, doesn't he? At the cross, Jesus was not killed. He died as a foreknown plan of God brought from the foundation of the world. This is no accident. Jesus did not go kicking and screaming to the cross wondering in a cold sweat how he's going to get out of this pickle, asking Gabriel to fetch plan B because he's off his throne because he's having an anxiety attack. No, 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 Peter says. Let Make no mistake. You meant it for evil, but God has known this thing for the foundation of the world. And you can huff and you can puff, but his kingdom is forever. My, uh, my dad was a great storyteller. I miss him terribly on a lot of counts, but... Uh, he, got, uh, he lived, grew up on the farm, and he got his first TV in the home after he graduated high school. So most of my grandparents' life, they didn't have television, let alone a phone. And my dad went through his formidable years. Now, he went to the movies, the matinee and 
he loved Roy Rogers and Gene Autry, and so he went to see their movies, but he didn't have it in his house. So consequently, this is a generation that were master storytellers. I think um, technology, for all of its good, has done a disservice to the creative mind. We, we like to be entertained, right? Uh, and so my father, you know, for his entertainment, you went to the movies on Saturday night, uh, but then the rest of the week you sat around a tree and told stories. And my dad was very good at it, as his dad was. When I was a kid, I had two options every night to be tucked in. That's how my parents said, go to bed. We, who do you want to tuck you in? That's what they'd always say. Do you want mom to tuck you in or dad? Well, if I was having a bad day and I wanted my, someone to caress my head and sing to me, it was always mom. But if I wanted someone to tell me a story, it was always dad. So dad, tell me a story. And dad would get in bed with me, lay parallel next to me, and he'd always rub his whiskers against my cheek. He was that close. And he'd always say, Brisey, what story do you want? And he'd make up some. He would tell me about his life. And I, all, I heard these stories so many times that I knew, the, I knew them. But I love nursery rhymes. Little Red Riding Hood. Little Red Hen. The Little Engine That Could. And a host of others. My all-time favorite, at least from my dad telling it, was The Three Little Pigs. Anyone not heard of the three little pigs? Okay. I, 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 my dad told me that story dozens and dozens. I could, I could recite it, but my dad had such a flair for storytelling that every time he told it, I, was this the moment? The wolf was actually going to win because he'd get to that and he'd say, you know, he'd use all this dr drama at, at night in my bed and I'd imagine, hey, I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house down. He'd always do that. And, and of course, I, he was so dramatic. Well, I, I thought I know how the story's going to turn out. I'm not sure. It's, it's so dramatic. But guess what? That old wolf huffed and he puffed and every time he never blew it down. David writes a psalm to depict this, Psalm 69, and he says, The kings of the nations look at God, and they huff, and they, they really think they're going to do it this time. I mean, 2021, maybe it's the year where, you know, Jesus strikes out. We never know. But they huff, and they puff, and they never shake his kingdom. His kingdom is from shore to shore. And we'll do it till we wax and wane no more. This is why, beloved, the Christian cause is a cause worth fighting. This is why, beloved, Martin Luther and Charles Wesley knew what they were talking about when they said his kingdom is forever. Father God, I thank you for this dear people for their love of you. I pray they receive this word by faith. I pray that this church would be like another hymn writer of old, John Rippon, who said of your kingdom, we will never, no, never, no, never forsake. Thank you. In the name of Jesus, our Lord, we pray. Amen.